Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. I've known Jane Schottel for, it's got to be close to 30 years. She's one of those people with whom you can sit down and catch up and feel like no time has passed whatsoever. I hope you'll find her wisdom as rich as I do. I'm grateful for her friendship. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation. This is episode three. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me today. I, I guess it's a bit funny to speak to someone who I feel like I know really well, and yet there's so much <laughs> more to know about you. And the more I spend time with you now that you have a little less crazy lifestyle, I've certainly learned to appreciate you a, a lot more than I've been able to over the last 10 years or so. That's very kind. Thank you. I, I would say I'm, I'm really thrilled to be asked. It's a wonderful opportunity. And I think the guiding theme is really terrific. And I think it's quite timely. And I can't help but think it's going to be quite meaningful to people. I know Jane as an actor, a Second City alumni, a writer, an internationally respected film programmer, an animal lover, a mentor to hundreds, if not thousands of people, and a mensch. <laughs> Did I miss anything? I, I'm, I'm blushing through the radio. I, <laughs> uh, that's also very kind. But I, I would hope that most of that is true. I can vouch for some of it for sure from my end. We've spoken at length about the idea of this podcast and the image of being in the arena and putting yourself out there, living courageously. What does that mean to you? That's something I have been thinking about a lot, as you say, and I've come to realize that it means different things at different times of your life. When I was very young, I thought nothing of turning my back on everything, getting on an airplane and moving to New York. I knew nothing. I knew no one. I didn't really have any money. All I knew was I needed a bigger life. I needed to see more things than I was able to see. I needed to experience more things. And when I look back, it was insane, but it was also the right thing to do. That's not the kind of thing that I would do now. I don't need to do that now. I think my courage, when I can find it, when I reach for it, is actually more internal, smaller things, trying to change really ingrained habits or ways of being or ways of thinking because the fact is this life would be pretty fine and pretty great if I didn't change those things it would be just fine but I know enough to know that actually it would be better and I would be better if I endeavor to change these things whether they are a way of thinking a way of being, uncovering all kinds of unconscious bias or things that I've done or whatever. So that's where courage is. It's less about stepping on a plane and flying 4,000 miles. It's stepping out the door. <laughs> you know, in a time of pandemic, it's stepping out the door. And I think in a weird way that the pandemic and quarantine and isolation and all those things can be seen as a massive metaphor for what the world has needed to do, which is shut out the hurly-burly of everyday life, of shut down the traffic noise that all of us were so engaged in and create some quiet and clearing our schedules and clearing our decks. Even if we had to work from home, life got a lot less complicated. We did not have to find time to fit in the gym. We didn't have to get on the subway. We didn't have to sit in traffic. We didn't have to do a lot of those things. So I think for many people, it ideally created a little bit of quiet in order to look inside ourselves and to absorb the upheaval of what was going on in other places. I wonder at times whether the horrific tragedy of George Floyd's death would have perhaps been absorbed in just this maelstrom of this lineage of, of horrible things 
that often would happen. And we would feel terrible at the time looking at the news and then go, we would be distracted by the next thing that would happen the next day. By we, I mean the majority of white people in North America or the Western world who uh, meant well, but couldn't actually absorb or wouldn't actually absorb the tragedies and injustices that were happening at that level. We knew the list of names. We meant well, but we would continually be distracted by all of the things that required our attention. And they're not stupid things. They required our attention. But I think the pandemic took some of those things away. And it meant that all of a sudden we were living less cluttered lives. And so the full emotional impact of this accumulated, this this waterfall of injustice has happened, particularly you know, the last 20 years in the United States, particularly the last five, particularly the last two. These things have a cumulative effect. So you asked me about courage. I mean, I that's what courage is. Courage is to to walk in the streets of Portland when you've left a child at home in the care of their grandparent because Black Lives Matter and you fear tear gas, Mm. you fear clubbing, you fear arrest, because that could be cataclysmic in your life. So my little courage is that I'm looking at during this time, because I'm immunocompromised, I can't walk in those streets. I do walk with them in spirit. My courage is much more mundane, but Equally, I suppose that's important to me. But I'm inspired by those people who walk at great cost to themselves. And as John Lewis said during his life and in his death, they are out there causing good trouble. That is courage. I would say that the journey inward for many is also a massive act of courage. So that self examination is as courageous as anything, facing the batons, certainly facing the tear gas, facing the potential death. I see the journey of courage or the acts of courage as a continuum. There's at one end, people jumping out of airplanes or facing the fire or facing the firing line, all the way through to someone who is taking the first step to questioning their thinking on a subject for the first time and examining that thinking in a moment. And then perhaps taking steps toward making change in their own lives, educating themselves about white fragility, educating themselves about Black Lives Matter and and what the issues really are and, and keeping an open heart and an open mind about what those issues are, what they look like. That can be the arena. That can be the act of courage, is to challenge yourself, thinking that you're a social justice advocate, and oh yes, I give to these charities, and I do all these things, but what am I really doing? How is it that I'm showing up every day, and how is that really ultimately my act of courage to examine that part of myself. I think you're right. When I think about courage and changing the way that we think, I think of a film titled Skin, which was made by filmmakers Guy Nativ and his wife, Jamie Lee Newman. They uh, famously won the Oscar for the short film of the same name. And it's the true story of a gentleman who belonged to a white supremacist organization and what happened when he started to change his mind. That's courage. When that community doesn't want to let you go and threatens your family, even though you realize that you don't feel that way anymore. It's a perfect story about what is the the cost of change and what is the cost of courage. That's why what he did was a remarkable thing. And there are many, many people who do that and they do it unheralded. But that's really, I think people battling addiction, it's the same thing. Because addiction is such a, initially, anyway, a cozy, wonderful thing. It's a salve to your hurt, right? Whatever it is that you're addicted to doesn't let you down ever. It's so dependable until it's not. But these are massively personal struggles. At the end of the day, it's down to you. Mm. 
it's down to you whether you're going to act a different way, whether you're going to speak to your partner in a different way, speak to a parent a different way, snap that cigarette in two. I, I, you know, what, pick, pick what it is. And these are the small but critical battles that we can choose to face every day. And you're right, it's an arena. And whether it's a gladiator type one where you feel all of these eyes on you because you're trying to change behavior or ways of thinking that are really supported in your community or your family, or whether it's just a place that has finite walls where you think, okay, this is the limit of what I can explore at the moment. I hope we are living in a time where people feel supported to do that kind of self-examination. Because ultimately, what those quarantines, I hope, will have taught us is that people's opinion of you is none of your business. Our insularity, ideally, will have led to some important self-examination that we should not care. We should not think at all about what other people think of us. The most we should worry about is what they think about the look of our apartment in a Zoom call. <laughs> that's where, judge, where people are judging now, you know, and that's totally legit. What's your legacy? What impact would you like to have? <laughs> it's the $30,000 question. You don't mess around. I honestly don't know. Legacy to me sounds something like that's what important people leave. <laughs> legacy is, uh, how can I say, my Angelou had a legacy. I realize now, let me, I'll step back from that a moment and say two things. I have been thinking about that issue again, because I realize the next thing that I do in my life is an important one, because I've got less in front than I've got behind, as they say. And so I really want what I do in the next stage of my life to be for myself, both in my work as a film programmer, but also the work that I did prior to that in other places, programming and arts. And then before that, and for that, I did a lot of living for other people in my family, in my relationships, in my work, etc. And I feel quite comfortable becoming quite selfish now and saying that this next bit's for me which is why I'm trying to figure out how to actually do it. I'm not really good at listening to myself because I got really good about what does fill in the blank need. This organization, my project, the people around me, the people who work for me, what do fill in the blank they need. But as you say, to quote exactly what you're doing in the arena, and that arena would have been a film screening where you have a cue and afterwards, to challenge the way that people think there is nothing more gratifying than to think that perhaps you can be the rock in the shoe. <laughs> now that I say it, I, I would hope perhaps that would be a legacy that I was able to bring together people who did not think alike and who challenged each other and maybe went away thinking differently. What better thing? That sounds wonderful. What would you do on your last day? Oh, try to make it my second to last. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. um, my last day. Oh my gosh. Oh, you know what my first impulse is to say is to try to contact anyone I've wronged. I try to make it right. Yeah, and make sure that everybody that you love knows that you love them. Or, you know, I hope that they know that you love them. Or maybe you can say, these are the things that you meant to me, and I hope I gave you something back. But I think that you have to make your peace. Yeah, I know, ideally you've got your peace in a world, because as I say, you don't know, and I've seen this in my own life, I've known far too many people far too many people who just dropped and were gone. Yeah. And uh, I'm really, really taking that to heart. And so at the end of every day, I try to, even in the difficult days, go, oh, did you do something maybe that was of value to the world and in the smallest possible way? And is there something that you did for yourself? And the answer isn't always yes, but I would 
hope that would also be a thing going forward, that as we are older, we learn to find peace. And, oh, God, you just made me think of something. When I was a kid and I went to camp, I didn't like camp. I was not an outdoor person. Twice over the years, I phoned my mother and made her come and get me because it's just like there are too many bugs. And I, don't like, I don't like sleeping outside. The activities are stupid. I remember very vividly one year at camp, and I would, I don't know, I would have been maybe 11 or 12. And we were sitting around and it was a church camp. There were always church camps, which always made it more difficult because I always ask questions that church things don't like to answer. I got kicked out of Sunday school. I don't know if I ever told you that because they just said she asked too many questions. We're just not having her. I was sitting around the campfire and I forget what we were talking about, but the counselor asked everybody as we went around the fire and said, um, oh, when you think about yourself as an adult, what is the things that, that you'd like to have, that you aspire to? People said, oh, I'd like to maybe have a house or the boys all said, I'd like a car. Some people said, I'd like to be married. And I remember very vividly being the last person and being like a little bit embarrassed. But I said the first thing that came to my mind and I said, I'd like peace of mind. And I remember the look at the counselor and he said, well, that's, that's a, that's a very interesting thing to aspire to. As if looking at me like you are some sort of freak of nature. But it is exactly true, you know. I was a very anxious child and all that stuff, and I remember that now. And I think probably that will be the thing that I continue to aspire to going forward, is peace of mind, an acceptance of myself and the world and life. And I think that would, that's what I would hope on the last day of my life, it's that I could either find or know that I have found peace of mind. I've seen the difference between people who pass away, not at peace with the world, and people who do have peace. And they are profoundly different experiences. The word redemption has been Uh, sitting with me. Oh. Various things you've said so far. I just, uh, the word redemption kept coming to me. We can, all of us, look to our past and say, oh my gosh, that was a big mistake, or I'm trying to get past this, or how do I get through this difficult time? Will this define me? Why can't I get past this? We're all looking for those kinds of things, and it's incredibly difficult. That's why some of us are stuck behind in difficult times or we feel that we are defined by things, particularly if they were publicly embarrassing or if they, we wish they weren't known by other people. The age of social media, my God, redemption with a capital R. We have both faked redemption and other people who are authentically attempting to redeem themselves because far too much of our lives, if we allow it, is lived out in public now. That said, Things like social media and followers and social media pools and, again, arenas, we give people that power. We follow them. We watch them. We look. We click on it. We do all of that. I think young people don't realize enough how much they have the power to not do that. Mm-hmm. But redemption is something that, that people search for all their lives. I think they, they carry a lot of hurt. They carry so much pain. My redemption would have to be this inner voice that is always about you must do more, you are not enough, Um, no matter what you do, it's not enough, it's all of these kinds of things. Now, I would have to redeem myself and be at peace with and feel that that peace is earned. The thing that I and I suspect a bunch of women struggle with is that we think peace means either acquiescence or standing still after long periods of activity and striving. And I've got a job and a business and three children and all of these things, you know, that women do to themselves and that the world does to women. So it's trying to understand that peace, peace and stillness are not acquiescing. They are not defeat. They are not giving up. They are not any of those things, that they are 
actually when you find stillness and stand at the top of the mountain, it's when you are the victor. It's knowing these things intellectually, but then trying to have them. That, that's, that's the beast, you know. Is there anything know. else you'd like to share before we wrap up? No, I'm interested in people, though, and I'm interested in how we manage these times and all times. And I'm interested in other people very much, you know. So I would look forward to you going on to the other people that you'll talk to. Because I think this subject of how do we find courage, what are the ordinary acts of courage, which to me are often far more momentous the woman who sticks her leg out to trip the Nazi. You know, that's an extraordinary act of courage. I'm really interested in what people think about that in this world in which we live going forward. Hmm. So I'm really interested that you're going to talk to people who know about that. Well, I'm grateful to have you with me on, on this journey. Love you very much. And, and back to you, vice versa. Thank you for listening. If you think someone else would enjoy hearing this episode, please share it with them. And tune in next time to hear my guest's story about how joy and laughter play a central role in her life and how she learned at an early age not to let anyone tell her no. And let me tell you, she is a force. (laughs) It's a lively and inspiring story. I hope you'll join us. Until next time, I'm your host, Linda McLaughlin, in the arena. (laughs) 